This is to do with bootloaders in JAL, specifically bootloaders in JAL. What a bootloader is. First of all, we're all using microcontrollers because microcontrollers are really clever things. They're, any digital circuit that you've got, you can replace practically with a microcontroller. We need a circuit to program that microcontroller so we could use a microcontroller to do that. And if you look inside a PIC kit 2 or a PIC kit 3 or a snap or whatever, there's a microcontroller. But why not actually use the microcontroller that we're using to program the chip that we're, that we're working on? And that's what a, boot, a bootloader is. It makes the chip pull itself up by its own bootstraps. Philosophically, the bootloader starts at boot time. When the machine starts, the bootloader starts. It's designed to load code onto the chip. So it itself is just a piece of code on a programmable device that allows it to upload user code, the code that you've written onto that chip. So that makes the chip self-programming. And the bootloader code is entirely separate from the user code, as I will hopefully demonstrate. And when I've said it starts at boot time, I've put a wee asterisk next to that because some bootloaders check regularly. If you've used an Arduino, you'll know that you can just start sending stuff to an Arduino anytime because the Arduino's bootloader is continually checking to see if it has to run AVR dude again. So there's what it looks like. You start your chip. At first thing it does is it checks for the bootload trigger. If there's no bootload trigger, then it goes round and runs your main user program, and your main user program is a loop anyway. And so that's you and your user program doing whatever it would normally do. If the bootloader trigger is present, then it will execute the bootloader. And the bootloader itself is essentially a little bit of program that copies data from the PC to the user program area, so that you've now got a new user program uh, to run. Technically, you need a trigger mechanism. That can be a push button or a, a jumper link. If you look at the ESP32s and ESP8266s and the black pills and the blue pills are STM32s, and a lots, lots and lots of these things have got two little tactile switches on the board, and you have to push one button down while you press the other one. You push a, a, an I.O. pin down while you reset it so that when the reset lifts, the other button's still down and that's the trigger mechanism for the bootloader. On the Arduino and on, on others, it's a serial port line. There's a, an RX and TX between the Arduino and the PC. And if the PC wants to use the bootloader, it simply puts a signal onto the TX of the PC, which is the RX of the Arduino. And when that goes low, that brings the trigger mechanism, gets the trigger mechanism's attention. Or another one is a simple timer. And the, the JAL lib one that I'm going to demonstrate to you later on uses the timer idea. So I'll get to that in a wee while. It needs to be able to download and write memory. Not all PIC chips can write memory. Particularly older PIC chips, the, the way it's worked out, you can't actually use the program to write into the program space. The nature of the PIC chip is get two banks of registers, one with a program in it, typically 14 bits across, and one with the data in it, the, the, the FSRs, the special function registers, the I.O., indirection registers and the status registers and the program counter and all that good stuff, and they're all 8-bit things. And you can write and read read and write and write specifically is the, the part of it that we're talking about to the 8-bit FSRs and all that stuff, but you can't write to the 14-bit program memory. So that's a problem for some to fix. It will use some RAM registers, but once the, the bootloader's finished, those RAM registers are freed up, and so your main program can use them as well. It may use an interrupt. Very few of them do but it's worth thinking about if you're writing one, are you going to use an interrupt? And if so, which interrupt? And a bootloader is typically less than 2K on the chip that you're using, but typically more than 1K. 
so that you're not going to get a bootloader onto a 675 like we were just talking about. You get one in an 18313, I'll give you one for an 18313 if you want it. Got one of those, but not for a 675 because a 675 doesn't have the space for it. Advantages of using a bootloader, you don't need a pick kit 2 or a pick kit 3 or any of these things. You don't need to have that five wire ICSP connection, which means you don't need to lead those out to a, a plug in the edge of the board. You don't have to worry about if MD here's used and a pick kit two or three or four, that issue about where's it getting its power from? Is the power coming from the pick kit or is the power coming from the board and is the voltage appropriate and all that good stuff? That goes away, as does that thing on the older Merge kits where Merge were doing their own five way ICSP connector that was not entirely compatible with the pick kit one and you had to make up a little jumper board or something. So not all of that stuff disappears. You can update code in the field. You don't actually need to have a pick kit to update the code to make the code do something bigger, better, more. It's easier to use. It's less arcane than using the pick kit or MP lab. And you can have three or four devices. I can quite happily have four devices here all plugged in. And they've all got bootloaders on them, so I can just upload them all. I can just tell it to put the same program, put a new version on all four and see if they'll speak to each other now, rather than do one, unplug the pit kit, do the next one, unplug the pit kit and move along. So there's a lot of advantages to it. And it's not without disadvantages. It costs you a lump of ROM, as I say, about 2K. It is capable to accidentally overwrite the bootloader uses 2K ROM, you can accidentally overwrite it. Now, if you accidentally overwrite the bootloader with your main program, then all that happens is you lose the bootloader. Your main program will still run, but your bootloader isn't there anymore. Now, sometimes that's actually a, a desirable thing, but I've put it in here as a disadvantage, because if you're wanting to continually develop and keep updating, then you have to be careful not to overwrite the bootloader. It may cost you a pin if you need a, but a push button or you need a link or you need the, to sense the RX line for the, the serial port, then it might cost you a pin. It exposes you to other people looking at your code. If you can go into your code via the bootloader, so can other people. And you need the programmer once. You need to have a, a pit kit 2 or a pit kit 3 or something one time to put the bootloader onto the chip. But that's all. You can get serial USB bootloaders. You can get CAN, LIN, I squared C, I triple I three C, SPI, JTAG, Ethernet. All of these, SPE, single pair Ethernet. I've been doing a bit of work in the past year on single pair Ethernet for automotive applications and for industrial applications. And I will be most surprised if in the next two or three years we're not putting single pair Ethernet interfaces onto model railway applications where we're now putting CAN bus, because I'm finding CAN buses gently disappearing and being replaced by, by single pair Ethernet. The other thing is that serial and USB are essentially the same thing. I showed one of these things in a, an earlier presentation for £2.99 from our friends in the East. You plug a USB port into one end of it and you've got a, a complete six wire serial port there that works at 3.3 volts or 5 volts, depending on a jumper. And that will turn a USB port into a serial port. So if you've got, let's say you're looking at the 18313, it doesn't have a USB port on it, but it does have a UART on it. So you can make a serial bootloader, pop a serial bootloader onto it, and then just use one of these to bootload via your USB. As I say, all the usual suspects are there. Now, I've already mentioned the Harvard versus Van Neumann thing. This was a sort of dichotomy that never really existed. Uh, the first computer architecture 
the ROM and the RAM and the I.O., the memory mapped I.O. and everything was all in one great big long address space that started at 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 and headed off in direction of all the Fs. And then the Harvard architecture was dreamed up. Actually, the Harvard architecture was named about 25, 30 years after people started using it. They just dreamed this name up for it, whereby the program lives in one block and all the rest lives in another block. When the PIC chips first came out, if you go and look at the old data sheets for the early PIC chips, they, on the front page in big letters, they make a great deal of the fact that they're Harvard architecture. But because they're Harvard architecture, you can't overwrite the program. And if you can't overwrite the program, you can't really use a bootloader. So first of all, they started putting in bootloader blocks, which are bits of block, blocks of memory that are rewritable, and you can boot the bootloader on there. And then they started making it more general, where you can specify what the bootloader block is, and eventually they sort of stopped it, and you can actually just overwrite the code now. So it's only really old picks that don't uh, accommodate a bootloader. And most of those wouldn't have a space anyway. You need 2K for your bootloader. You need space for your own program. So you really need a pick chip that's at least about 8K, 16K, 32K, no problem. But if you're down at 2K or 4K, you're not going to have space to put your own program in there. You need to have some sort of interface. As I say, a USB or a serial or a CAN or whatever you want to use. It can be a hardware interface or a software interface. If you've got a chip, let's say the 675, that doesn't have a UART peripheral on it, you can actually bit bang a UART peripheral. I did a, a presentation for the, the West of Scotland people on that. And you can look at look that one up on the, the WASAG videos page. And if you've made a serial interface for your program, then on so in software, a software serial interface, that'll load a bootloader. But you've used some of your space for the serial interface, which means you've made your bootloader bigger. The other thing I put in there is you should also think about your user firmware. If I'm if I'm writing a program that uses the serial port then I'm going to have all the serial port stuff in there anyway. And so there's nothing to stop both my user application and the bootloader both using the same I.O., the same USB interface, the same serial interface, the same CAN interface, or the same I2C interface. And I've said must, I've maybe, maybe using must has been a bit much here, but I suggest that you get the bootloader from the same place, the bootloader application from the same place that you get the bootloader code, because there's hundreds of bootloaders out there, and each one of them has got a piece of firmware that matches a, an application for the PC, and they don't always mix well. If you get a bootloader for one purveyor of bootloaders, then a bootloader application from another might not talk to it. So better to get them at the same time. Every time there's a new generation of pick chips, then there's a new generation of bootloaders. There's hundreds of them out there. Plus, Adafruit, Sparkfront, Micro, Vellum, and all of these people do their own bootloaders. The reason they do that, because here's a bootloader program. If you've bought our chip, you can update it and all that good stuff. And it's tie-in. You're then tied into buying our products. And so for that reason, a lot of people do that. Also, hobbyist groups academic institutes. Uh, this means that you don't have to, if I've got a, a student lab with 30 students in it, I don't have to put out 15 pit kit threes at £75 a throw. If I can do it all by a bootloader and they can use their own laptop and a serial app, a USB cable, that saves me having to put expensive gear out that might go walkabout. Most of these things don't talk to each other, so you have to get the firmware and the app at the same time. AVR DUD and AVR DUD S. AVR DUD is the bootloader for the Arduino. And it's a really, really professional piece of kit. And AVR DUD S is a GUI version. It's AVR DUD with clothes on. It's got buttons and pull down lists and, and all that sort of stuff for picking the chip and 
picking the modes and, and all that happy stuff. That's available for some picks. This is a thing called a chip kit. Uh, and the chip kit uh, picks and uh, a one called Pingduino and another one called Jalduino all use AVR Dude or AVR Dude S, but they're all based round about PIC 24s or MX32 chips, which are bigger chips than we're talking. We're generally talking about things in the 8 bit space with JAL. So AVR Dude and AVR Dude S are wonderful for Arduino, but for most part, they're not really available for, for us, for the for JAL. The people that made JAL Lib settled on two, one called PDFS USB and one called USB bootloader.py. And those are both in the JAL Lib. If you go into your JAL Lib and have a wee dig about, you'll actually find these programs already included. But those aren't the only microchip bootloaders. You'll find bootloaders in the JAL lib examples. You know how the when you unpack the JAL lib, you get a, a directory of examples. There's seven or eight in there. If you go to microchip, MCC includes a generate a bootloader button. And you as along with the, you know, the codes where you generate the, the user or you generate a timer or a PWM, you can just generate a bootloader as well in there. It's part of the MCC. Harmony. Now, Harmony is the, the more grown up, the bigger version of MCC. MCC is for configuring chips. Harmony is for configuring systems. So it includes things like TCP IP stacks and USB stacks and stuff like that. Harmony grew out of a thing called MLA. And both of them are replete with lots and lots of bootloaders. There's also a dozen bootloaders built into the microchip application notes. And if you go and download the any of the demo disks or the CD evaluation CDs for any of these, any of the chips, they all practically anything from about 20 or 30 years ago, the evaluation CDs that microchip put out, you will find that they will include, no doubt, a bootloader. So I just went into, as you see, C drive, Jallab workplace slash sample. Give me a directory of everything that's got the word boot in it. And there's, what's that? One, two, three, four, five. There's eight different bootloaders. Some of them are standard bootloaders. Some of them are auto start bootloaders. I'll explain the difference when I'm doing my wee demo further down the road. If you go into MCC, again, follow the, the yellow marks. There's a, in the, the content libraries, there's an 8-bit bootloader library. And if you open that, it gives you a half a dozen different bootloaders that are available. And if you go to MLA, again, there's device bootloaders, there's host bootloaders, there's pre-compiled demos of bootloaders and bootloader applications, there's HID bootloaders, there's CDC bootloaders, there's all sorts of bootloaders available. So there's, there's quite the cornucopia of them. Also, just for the giggles, I had a wee look at my own PC and I went into C drive and I said, give me a look at everything that says bootload, star dot star. And I found 3,500 files and 802 directories with the word bootload in them. So there are an awful lot of bootloaders. So let's talk about the bootloaders for JAL. As I said, there's two that the JAL lib people have settled on. The first one is this. It's called the PicDem Full Speed USB Demo or the PDFS USB, right? PicDem Full Speed USB. PDF SUSB demo tool. I'll be using that in a wee while if I've got it on this machine. And that's what it looks like. There's two tabs there. One's the bootloader mode. The other one 
it comes for a demo board, which I'll show you in a minute and talk about. But that uh, lets you read the potentiometer and reads the thermometer and reads the push buttons and lights the LEDs and does all that stuff on a demo board. It's of little interest to us at the minute, but we'll, we'll get to it in, a, in just a moment. Or there's the, the USB bootloader.py, which again is in the JALLIB. If you go into JALLIB and have a dig, you will find that. Now, I've got to tell you a couple of things about that if you're thinking about using it. First of all, as you can see, it's console only, which is good, because if you want to automate your processes, then buying a console only line in it is, is a useful thing. But it's a Python script, and it likes Python 2.7. If you try to use Python 3.0 anything, it'll fail. It'll fail over things like Python 2.7 let, let you type print, open quotes, whatever you wanted to print, close quotes. Python 3, you need to print, open bracket, open quotes, whatever you want, close quotes, close brackets. So it's lots of wee syntaxy things like that. Uh, you can go through it. It's quite a big program. It's, I think it's a couple of thousand lines of Python. But if you can put 2.7 on your machine for an afternoon, and if you put 2.7 on, it won't clash with 3. Point anything. You can have both on your machine without any conflict. And so you can put 2.7 on, you can run this and take it off again. And why I say you can run this and take it off again is in the same directory as this USB bootloader.py, you will find a program called setup.py. And setup.py will run, uh, there's a module, a, a Python module called py2exe. And what that does, well, it'll take that, uh, that program there, USB bootloader, and convert it into an executable. So what you've then got is an exe file that you can use in line to send stuff straight to a chip without using a pick kit. So I'm going to use a working example. Here it is here. The pick kit 18F14K50 is a 20 pin chip that's been available for the last two or three years. Uh, I've put the device resources there from MCC up as well, just to let you see it's got comparators and DACs and use apps and timers and PWMs and all the usual suspects. So this has got all the normal things that you would want, plus it's got a USB hanging out the side of it. Because it's got a USB hanging out the side of it, it needs, see that capacitor down at the bottom there on pin 17? And that capacitor is mission critical. The USB subsystem on here seems to be the same USB subsystem that was on the, the 18F4550 and the 18F2550. It behaves exactly the same way. It needs exactly the same crystal and it needs that same capacitor. Everything that happens in USB happens at 3.3 volts. And so the chip has to have a 3.3 volt regulator on board. And that capacitor is to smooth out the output of the 3.3 volt regulator. It's a switch mode regulator, obviously. And if you get that capacitor wrong, your USB won't work. But it's always between 0.22 of a microfarad and 0.47 of a microfarad ceramic. So it's one of three values of capacitor, basically. But I've had to change from 0.22 to 0.47 to get it to work. And I've had to change from 0.47 to 0.22 to get it to work. If you ever make one of these things up, you plug it in and the USB doesn't work. That's the first thing you check is that capacitor. I've also put a reset switch on it so that I can press the reset button simply to, to save me unplugging and replugging the cable to stop wear on the cable and wearing my soldering. That's what it looks like on a, a piece of prototyping board. There's the chip, a couple of rows of headers, the crystal, the 22 puff loading capacitors for the crystal, and a couple of the resistor for the switch and all that. I've made SMTs and put in the other side of the board. And there's a tactile switch there for resetting it. Then it is 
on a printed circuit board, on the, a dev board. That was a slightly beefier dev board that's got a prototyping area and it's got sub dual supplies and stuff. But it's basically the same circuit with the, the USB to the 1450 and just basically headers round about. And there's the chip that the board that this program was originally sent for, that was originally meant to be used with. And that's from, you can see 2004 is the date in that board. Now this board was available, as I say, 20 years ago. The, the, four, the, the chip that's on that is a 40 pin, an 18F, 4550, but they've since released a new version of this board with all the same stuff on the left-hand side of the board and the same software, just the 14K50, the newer chip as the actual active chip on it. So you can still do all the same stuff on the 14K50 as you could in the 45. As I say, they're the same, basically the same chip on the inside. And if you've got the very latest dev boards, and there's the the current Curiosity low pin count board. And all I've had to do there is plug a USB socket into it. Right. Which brings me on to USB. I've done a couple of demonstrations for the, the WASAG group. One on USB and USB drivers, and one talking about problems with USB-C and how to overcome them. Uh, and those are already up there. Uh, and the URLs, as you can see, are in the in this presentation on slide 28, if you want to go back and look for them later on. You might want to have a look at those presentations as well. So I'm going to talk about using the bootloader in your workflow if you're actually doing your work, if you're actually doing development. And there's four case use cases, but I'm only going to talk about one, one and a half. JAL edit plus the GUI which is the GUI that I showed you earlier, JAL edit plus the console apps, and then the same with Visual Studio Code, using the GUI and using the console apps. It won't take long. If I start JAL edit and I open the Blinky, there's the simplest Blinky for this chip, 18F14K50Blink.hs, that's for a high-speed crystal, and that compiles and runs. And that's without bootloaders. I need, once I've compiled that, I then need a pick kit to put it on my chip. However, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to rename it by putting BL at the end. Now that's not a thing you have to do. That's just something that I'm doing so I know which one is which. If it's for the bootloader, then it's got the BL at the back of it. And what I do to make it bootloader sensible is I go to Tools, uh, Environment Options, and the first panel in Tools, Environment Options, if you go to the JAL tab, the first panel is, are you using a bootloader, sir? And there's four choices there. Screamer and B-loader. These were old serial bootloaders for back in the day, for 25 years ago. They were for serial bootloaders for when you were using 628s and 88s and stuff like that. And they made serial bootloaders for those. They work. They're still available. SparkFun, of all people, are supporting them at the minute. If you go to the SparkFun site, you can find uh, links to the Screamer and B-loader serial bootloaders. Rick Farmer was a guy that wrote bootloaders for a number of picks as well. Again, serial bootloaders. And they were for a company in, in Australia called Dontronics that some of you may have heard of. They made some smashing pick boards very early on. And Farmer's bootloader is for the Dontronics boards mostly. The third option is simply to force the first instruction to be a long jump. If you're going to knit your own bootloader code, then you can tell it I want the first instruction to be a jump, a long jump to somewhere in memory where I'm putting my bootloader. That's, that's interesting if you're writing your own bootloader from scratch. It's of no interest to us. The last option simply says, 
use the 18 series bootloader preamble, which means imagine we've got an 18 series bootloader. And if you have, how much space do you need? So I tell that I'm going to need 2K, 2048 spaces. So once I've done that and I compile it, it compiles exactly the same, except down at the bottom, it's added an extra switch. It says loader 18, 2048. Loader 18 is, it's the, the PIC 18 series loaders, and you want 2048 bytes put aside. So at that point, I simply, I'm compiled and I'm, I'm, I'm away to the races. If I look at the directory, you will see that there's the blank HS that I compiled, and then there's the blank HS BL, which is the bootloader version that I compiled. And the everything's practically the same, right? The, the BL ones are slightly bigger in the assembler and stuff because they've got long jumps in them, but practically the same. If I look at the hex files, there's what an Intel th hex 32 file looks like. We could go into dismantling all that, but really life's too short and brutal as it is. What I will point out is that the addresses that it's going to put, practically all of that stuff on the screen there is the, the hex code that it's going to put into memory. The bits that are highlighted in yellow there are the addresses it's going to put. So if I compile it without the, boot, the bootloader link, then it simply puts the, the code starting at 0000, 0010, 000, 000, 000, and so on. But if I compile it with the bootloader link, it starts it at 0800, 0810, 0820, which basically means it's put it 2K up in the memory space. If I then go and load this demo tool, as I say, that comes as part of the JAL lib, there's a pull down there. If I have, if I say, if I actually loaded the bootloader, remember I showed you the bootloaders that are available in the examples case. I find the, the, the bootloader that I want, either the, the 14K50 bootloader or the 14K50 auto start bootloader, and I put that on the chip using my pick kit. Once I've done that, when I start this program, that drop down box will have an item in it. And once I've got the thing selected, I can go and load a hex file. And once I've loaded the hex file, as you can see, there's two hex files there. One's the blank without the, the BL and one's the blank with the BL. Now, if I was to load the blank without the BL, that would overwrite my bootloader. And that would be that would be the end of it. It would probably still work, but it would never work again. I'd have to then go and reload the bootloader. The BL version is the one that's been offset by 2K up to the 800 mark. And so it will load and bootload. So at this point, I pick one of those and press open. And you would expect that to just open, but it doesn't. It gives you a lot of dire warnings. Because the configuration, the bootloaders, are, the chip's already got the bootloader on it, so it thinks it's using a 12 megahertz chip, and it's got this clock for the, the USB system, and it's got the USB peripheral enabled, and it's got the uh, oscillator select set, all, all these different things. What you're putting in here doesn't jive with those things. Are you aware of that? So there's three options. If you type yes, it just but it just puts the program in, but that's okay. That's what I'm wanting to do. If I press no, it puts the program in, but leaves all the settings for the bootloader. So it doesn't add, doesn't change your configuration and you're, you're left with the worst of both worlds. And if I press cancel, then it just doesn't load anything. It just stops at this point. So I press yes, and in it goes. And from now, I can see that it has put my program in 
at location 000800, which is the 2K mark on my chip. Now, if I tell it to load the hex file, it'll load everything off of that chip. Then it's done. And as you can see, the bootloader runs up to 7C something. And then there's a whole bunch of FFFFF -F 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 where there's nothing. That's my little buffer zone. And then above that, at 00800, that's where I've put my program. Now, there's two options here. I can either use the bootloader or I can use the bootloader plus auto start. The bootloader needs a button pushed to invoke it so that when I'm running the bootloader, I hold a button down and that starts the bootloader. So if they hold a button down while I reset the chip, the auto start, it uses a timer. Once you reset the chip, when you have the USB negotiation goes on, the USB talks to the, the PC. And once it's done that, then you've got five seconds to use the bootloader, to start using the bootloader. And if during the five seconds you don't start using the bootloader, it just goes on and runs your program. But if you do start using the bootloader, then it uses the bootloader and you can do whatever you're going to do. So at that point, I'm hopefully going to try and do a wee demo of this for you. And there might be some mixed messages here. Let's see if I can get that up. And get that up. And you're hearing my voice, so you should be able to hear my computer going down. You know, the, the usual USB connecting and USB disconnecting type noises. So what I'm going to do is reach in and I reset this chip. All right. The, the LED stops flashing. The USB negotiation has now happened. So I'm now in the five seconds. Well, I missed it. Try again. USB negotiation happens. There we are. I can pick up that device. So I've now picked that device up. So what I can do just for talking sake is there's Jal Edit. I will make that 15,000 go up to 30 and that 15,000 up to 30 and I'll compile it. It's compiled. Go back to my bootloader and because I started the bootloader, I'm in, I'm playing with the bootloader, it'll leave me here all evening if I want. I can download a hex file and there's the BL1 that was compiled at 2019, so that's the one we've just done. So I open that. There's the, the dire warnings about this not fitting, but I don't care. So there we are. So I've now bootloaded that. At this point, I can either reset the machine and just let it tick through, or I can press the execute button. If I press the execute button, then the bootloader will close itself down. You'll hear the, the USB disengage as the PC notices that that USB device has just disappeared. And the, hopefully the LED will start flashing and flashing a wee bit slower than before. There we are. Diddly dump as the USB went missing. And that's the program started again. If I press the button, wait for the USB, ignore it for five seconds, there you are, the USB drops out and my program starts anyway. And at this point, I can't pick it up. I can't get the bootloader because I'm running my user code. So that's the auto start. That's the one I tend to use because it's easier. It costs you five or seven seconds at the start of each run. But if you're that busy that five or seven seconds at the start matters to you, then you really look at, need to look at some of your life choices particularly to do with coffee intake. So I'm going back to my demonstration. If I want to use the console along with JAL Edit, then all I have to do 
is go to Environment Options Programmer. That's the command line for that USB bootloader that we talked about on the top. And at the bottom, you'll see where it says, be verbose and write the file name. And so that's to tell it what to actually write or tell that Python script what to take. I tend to not do that. What I tend to do is write a little PowerShell script that has all this stuff in it so that I can go in and tinker with it and get it right and get it to my satisfaction. And if necessary, clean all the old files out every time I compile it and make a backup version if I want to and whatever it is. So I tend to use my own PS1 script for that. And if you use the prompt before programming button there, then every time you go up and press the little, see the little chip button at the top there? You press the little chip button, it will compile and it will give you this warning. Do you want to execute the programmer with that hex file? And if you tell it yes, it will execute it. <coughs> Moving on. Over a year ago now, we talked about Visual Studio Code and we talked about how to make the compile JAL task. And if you want to use the bootloader, you can go in and change your compile JAL task if you want to do that. It's a lot of work. Or you can add a new task. So you've got two compile options for JAL. You can compile normally or you can compile for bootloader. And those are in the, the previous vid that we did here last year. But there's a much simpler cheat that I'm using to let me just put the bootloader switch onto the command line. There's the same blinky light thing loaded in Visual Studio Code. And down at the bottom there, you see the command line that it's going to run or rather what it has just run to compile that, that JAL script. If you go back a few screens, there's the two versions in JAL edit of the command line. Remember the, the command line for the bootloader is the same as the command line without the bootloader, except for having minus loader 18.2048 added to it. So all I need to do is go in here and add minus loader 18.2048. And then when I press return on that, it'll compile it and it'll compile it so that it starts at 2K up, which means the bootloader gets left alone and it'll install. So again, I can use my bootloader straight out of Visual Studio. Exactly the same way if I'm going to use the console app. I do whatever I'm going to do to compile it, compile it in line, just using the command line, and then I add the loader, loader 18 switch as before, and then I manually write a line to upload it inside the terminal. Once I've done that and done it once, I can use the up arrow key in Visual Studio. Remember the up arrow key when you're in the terminal lets you go up to what you've previously done. So I can just go up through my history to the line before last and that'll recompile it. Up through my history to the line before last and that'll re-bootload it up to the chip so that even though I'm in a black screen, I can just use my up arrow to continually recompile and re-upload it to the chip. It doesn't take long. And whilst I've just mentioned a couple of ways of doing this, there's lots of other ways of doing it. You can write your own PowerShell or Python script. Auto IT, you'll do it. Roll in your own code. Actually, if you go and look at some of these bootloaders, you'll find that they're actually quite simple. There's bootloaders in Delphi and Pascal, C, C++, C Sharp, Assembler. There's all sorts of bootloaders and all sorts of things. They're all very similar. There's none of them hard. So if you want to write your own, it's quite easy. When you're programming for it, it doesn't care if you're using Assembler or JAL or C or whatever. It only knows about hex files. It only cares about hex files. 
As I said earlier, not all picks are bootloader compatible. You may have to reserve resources. You can't put a bootloader onto a chip that doesn't have some way of getting information into it, for example. You may lose resources. You're certainly going to lose a couple of key of memory, a couple of key of ROM. You might be stuck with resources. If you're using a serial bootloader or a USB bootloader, then it makes sense to use the same I.O. for your user program as the bootloader is using for its. And that way you don't have to have two versions of things in memory. You don't have to have two versions of the same routine. You don't have to have two copies of the, the, the constants and stuff. And so it uses less space and gives you more flexibility. Don't accidentally overwrite the bootloader. Yep. Don't make the bootloader inaccessible. A thing that people sometimes do is accidentally put the bootloader 2K up so that the bootloader can't load the bootloader, if you see what I mean. You will make these mistakes and you will learn from them. And you will thank me for reminding you at this point. Uh, and this doesn't arise in JAL, but you have to use relative addressing when you're writing code for a bootloader. JAL already does that naturally all the time, doesn't care. But some programming languages try to use short jumps and stuff like that to try and save space and, and optimize the use of the, the working registers and stuff like that. Doesn't matter in JAL, but if you're programming anything else with a bootloader, you have to think about it. If your bootloader doesn't work, you have to confirm hardware on both sides. Check your the USB port's working. Plug a thumb drive into it or a something else to make sure it's working. Check your hardware shows up in the device manager. Um, you need to check that capacitor, as I already mentioned. You need to make sure that the D plus and D minus from the USB port to the side of the pick aren't crossed. That happens a lot. RX, TX gets confused with TX and RX, and that gets that happens really, really regularly. So you have to get make sure you get those two right. The vendor ID and product ID have to be the same on your application and on your pick chip, and you have to get the ends right at both sides. If they're not, then you can change it on the chip to suit the PC application, or you can change it on the PC to suit the chip that you've got. Don't change both because you've probably changed them both to something wrong as well. And USB bootloader to USB user code clashes. I put that in because I've seen that happen, whereby you, if I have a USB bootloader, and let's say it's the microchip, microchip's vendor ID is a 048B. Right, so everything that I do that goes onto a microchip chip has got the same VID 048B. And let's say I use PID, product ID uh, 0001 for my bootloader. I can't then use 0001 for my application because the bootloader and the, app, the, the chip application are both in the same ID. So if I'm using USB on my device, you know, whatever I'm right, I'm building a, a USB Servo 4, for example, then its PID has to be different from the PID of the bootloader. So the bootloader 0001, my program can be 0002, but they can't be the same. And you have to make sure, it happens very regularly that people put a clash in. It's one of the quick checks you do when you're debugging these things. USB view is a quick way of checking this stuff, which we'll talk about some other time. Final thoughts, using the bootloader speeds development. You saw how quickly I can change something there without digging out a PIC kit 2 or a PIC kit 3. I just went down the USB and went onto the chip and the chip restarted. It can be tricky the first time, but once you've done it half a dozen times, it becomes natural. Think about the first time you did it with an Arduino. Most people, the first time they use Arduinos, 
they find it really, really hard. Most people nowadays yet don't know how to take the code off of an Arduino, for example. If you notice you can put stuff on an Arduino, but you can't get it off. If you know how to use the bootloader, you can. You change a switch in the bootloader and it'll extract code from the Arduino onto the PC. So it's a, a getting used to it, learning the tricks type thing. And I have to say that it's becoming less and less relevant bootloaders. They're useful, but if you're buying a new development board, nearly all the new development boards these days have got pick kit on board, which means the red development board has got a little bit of electronics at one end, which is a pick kit. In Microchip, put the pick kit on the dev board or put the pick kit on the Curiosity Nano so that you don't actually need to have a pick kit. And if you don't need a pit kit, then a bootloader's a kind of a waste of time as well, unless you want to make it user upgradable for your device in the field. So there's still uses there, but pit kit on board is making it less and less useful for developers. Those are a wee bit small, but they had to be made a wee bit small to get them onto the page. You all know where to find Jarlib. I've put MLA because a lot of people don't know about MLA, which is the precursor to Harmony. So there's where you can get that on the Microchip website. And I've put that up. That's the Microchip Legacy website. That's a brilliant page. That's got every version of all the Microchip software. All the compilers, all the MP labs, all the demo boards, all the CDs, the whole lot is in that web page. So you really should have that web page bookmarked somewhere. And at that, gentlemen, I think we've done enough. My email's there if you want to give me a shout about any of this stuff. If there's any thoughts, any questions, any comments, now's the time. <laughs>